Welcome to the Broken Lens Podcast. I'm Adam Stutz. And I'm Heather Watson. How you doing? I'm good. How you doing? I'm good. I'm good. I uh, I feel like I'm trying to catch up on rest, but uh, still not not quite getting it. So that dog of yours is stopping you from resting. I'm sure. Yes. Yes. She's she's been very active at night, and um, we're trying to move beyond crating, and so that's the ah. that that's the the goal, and we're getting there. She's she's been doing really good, but. But yeah, it's it's an adjustment period and not a lot of sleep. Well, you mentioned the other day also that you didn't sleep very much because you were up watching some foreign film, right? I was. Uh, there's this movie called Do Not Expect Too Much from the End of the World. And it's by um, Raju Jude. I'm probably butchering his name, but um, it's a Romanian movie and it's it's like totally wild. Like it's... it. it I, I don't even know how really to describe it. The plot starts with this woman driving around the city. She's a production assistant for a company that does these industrial films. And it's her interviewing different um, people that work for this company who are like maimed. And it's kind of a commentary on, on capitalism and, and its impact on Eastern Europe after the fall of communism. But uh, it's a just wild movie and there's this other movie this other film this romanian film about a woman taxi driver in 1981 82 that's kind of interspersed with the 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 main film and then um there is this cut to a um basically them filming like the industrial uh film um that she interviewed all these people for so it's it's a it's a fascinating movie it's it's very long i don't know if like you know someone might resent me if i recommended it to yeah, them I was gonna ask. <laughs> so but how did you even find this? So it pops up on my Instagram feed because I'm a movie subscriber and M U B I, right? M U B I, yeah. Um, and it is yeah, I saw people talking about it and and so I was just, you know, really interested. So Yeah, we get fed very, very different things. I watched some really stupid movies recently that I definitely would not recommend. I watched uh, that Jennifer Lawrence movie No Hard Feelings where she like dates a little boy yes. for money. Yeah. It was really bad. <laughs> There's some funny moments in it, but, but were, it I was, is. I was shocked by the full frontal nudity. Yeah. And it's like not in a sexual way at all. It was, that was interesting. But then I also watched, there's, um, I think it's new, a uh, Netflix movie with just like a ton of cameos. It's called Unfrosted um, about oh, the Kellogg and Post yeah, companies and like coming yeah. up with Pop-Tarts. Pop-Tarts. Yeah. It's like a stupid movie, but it's fun because there's just like a bunch of recognizable faces in it yeah. but it's yeah. certainly not like a riveting story yeah yeah i think uh it's was it directed by jerry seinfeld he's like the lead person yeah i don't know if it was directed by him yeah it seemed it seemed like a very seinfeld-esque topic yeah. so yeah. but i heard it's like a lot of comedians like Tons, com yeah. comedic like actors melissa mccarthy's in it and yeah uh, yeah, I don't know if that one's high on my list of, of no, I, I, <laughs> like out. I said, I wouldn't recommend it, but yeah. it was just like, huh, I wonder. It was yeah. like, it was kind of a background movie, so that yeah. it was good for Yeah, me. no, but those are great movies. I mean, and I just, I had just finished watching a couple heavier shows. I was mm. watching Way Late to the Party, but just finished Better Call Saul, and I also just finished the latest season, not as late on this one, but um, Invincible. Oh, yeah. I've heard really I good things about love. that. It's yeah. so good. Yeah. But it is. It's, like, pretty dark. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I've seen snippets of it, and it's, like, the violence is next level. So, yeah. Um, Which is something, like, I've watched it since, since the beginning, and going into it, I really had no idea what I was getting into. So, like, the first episode was, like, I, I, I just remember, feel, like, the shock that I felt watching that. It was unmatched like yeah. it was it was like exciting how unexpected it was yeah so this week's episode uh is a departure from kind of our standard format i sat down with um jared harvey who publishes under the name jared joseph and clark allen um his publisher on his most recent book and um we just kind of talked about the publishing industry 
and things that we thought were interesting and relevant to like our each of our own experiences and i thought it was a pretty good conversation yeah it was really interesting um as a listener to hear the perspective that you all like as a group had obviously you know as writers and publishers editors and talking about sort of how you came to pursue this Mm -hmm. um like the the troubles, uh, you know, trials and tribulations of the quote unquote industry that that we're working in, um, and it was just I think it's it's really going to be an interesting interview for everybody sort of that has a touch in this in this space. Yeah, yeah, and I think I think that um, I, I mean I hope that our listeners will like be able to glean something from it, and and um, just you know just folks who are interested in books and, and literature and just kind of like the process and and uh hopefully this will turn into maybe kind of like a regular thing where we can introduce various publishers like you know throughout kind of the small press world and kind of talk about their experience and and go from there so here's my interview with jared harvey and clark allen All right, Jared Harvey and Clark Allen, welcome to the Broken Lens Podcast. Thanks so much for being here today. And um, I'm excited about this conversation because of the fact that we get to get into talking about publishing. And, you know, this is going to be the first episode in which we kind of focus our efforts on having a conversation about, you know, different aspects of the publishing experience and, and what that means to each of you. And I think our listeners will have a lot of value and uh, that they can glean from from this conversation. I wanted to just kind of start the conversation off with just kind of a general question, like, can both of you describe, um, you know, kind of just how you got into publishing and, and you know, what was the, the launch pad? Okay. Yeah. Uh, thank you for having us both, by the way. Um, that's, there's sort of like a longer answer, I guess, is just that uh, I got into making art when I was a kid. I figured out you could fold up pieces of paper and, you know, write things in them and make like flip books and give them to your classmates. And, you know, eventually like learned about the world of zines and so forth. And then that's just evolved into my sort of like adult fascination. I started working in bookstores in my early 20s and just kind of never really looked back after that. Jared, what about you? I don't know. I mean, I I come from it you know, Clark publishes other people. So he's doing like the Lord's work. Uh, <laughs> I do you know, my own dumb work of like trying to get myself published uh, as a writer. Um, you know, uh, so my name is Jared Harvey. Uh, TurboTax calls me Jared Harvey. Uh, but I write under Jared Joseph. And originally, that was just something me and my like writing friends did when we were, you know, when we were teenagers. My friend Leaf, who's uh, Leaf, he wrote under Leaf Haven, even though his last name is Leaf Martinson. We all idolized him, so we all started doing the same thing that he did. Uh, so I was Jared Joseph instead of Jared Harvey. Carrie Lorig was Carrie Lorig. She doesn't have a middle name. Literally insane to me. Um, and then Mary Fung Chen just became Fung Sun Chen uh, and just dropped her first name. But we all like dropped a name. And it was a weird sort of like, this is how we convince ourselves that we are writers so we can have a writing persona. Um, we were all writing poems. And so, you know, uh, we became the speakers ourselves of our own poems. Um, I don't think we were thinking about publishing, but we published under those names as well. And then, yeah, like I, in undergrad, I studied, you know, creative writing like an idiot. And I was trying to get published and never got anything published for years. And then once I started giving up trying to get published, but still sending things out every now and again, I started getting published. And that was ironic. And it was always through small presses and everything that I was reading. uh, I was reading from small presses, especially poetry from small presses, because that's where everything really interesting um, and innovative uh, and also like relevant to politics and to, you know, the contemporary or the contemporaneous at the time was. So that's what I was reading. And then I would be like, oh, well, I want to be read, you know, in this press or in this journal as well. So then I would submit uh, and then just kind of kept doing that, I guess. Um, But yeah, just a sort of sense of like, 
this is where the writing community is, uh, the community that I want to be a part of. So I'll send them my things as well. And then sometimes they're like, welcome. Yeah, absolutely. And I, uh, I, I oh yeah, go ahead, Clark. Oh, I was just gonna say, I mean, uh, it's just nice of you to like DFI uh, the idea of uh, publishing other people's work, uh, Jared, thank you. But yeah, um, just kind of talking about like the community of people that you, um, that you were working with and started making you want to get your stuff out there. I mean, that was really what it was for me when I was younger um, is I started making zines. I made some, I made some friends that made zines. We started making zines together and passing those around. And I think there was just sort of like, we were all growing up in the Bay area and you know, the uh, like the nineties in the Bay area, there's, there's uh, was a much more like, it is probably still there. I don't, I don't fucking live there anymore, but uh, there, there was a, just sort of robust world of people exchanging that sort of stuff. And I think that's where I got the idea that it was like, okay, this, this has like meaning and power in like sort of like an underground way to a lot of people. Um, and that was, that was what like made me really want to start pursuing it. Um, and yeah, then, like I said, I went and started working in bookstores in my twenties and was reading things by like real authors and not just my friends, you know, and not just like a, uh, uh, kind of like not to disparage the random weirdos whose zines I was getting, but like, you know, um, yeah, things that were coming out of like New Directions and Dulkey Archive and stuff. And it gave me this whole other perspective of what I could be doing with it if I sort of started refining uh, the zines and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, also, just to note, uh, part of the reason I put out other people's stuff is just because I'm a really slow worker myself. Um, <laughs> I want to, I, want to be putting out more on my own but um i procrastinate a ton um but for some reason when i'm working for someone else i can i can kind of get my shit together and that's like i don't know the process has always been really exciting so yeah when someone comes to me with a book i'll, I'll i will put my own shit aside because I'm like oh like i have to do this because someone's actually working on it and that's not just me yeah yeah i um i found that having launched a journal and and you know and, and hopefully uh that will be a stepping stone to launching a press eventually that i've <laughs> i've kind of had the opposite experience where i felt like i was more productive prior to launching the journal and now that like i'm i'm more invested in trying to focus on reviewing other people's work which is inspiring and certainly gives me um, a lot to think about with regards to my own writing process and and how I edit the work that I do. I still find that that I'm kind of taxed after like going through multiple submissions and and even just you know the stuff that we end up selecting, trying to figure out you know the the layout process, the order of like you know the authors that we've taken, the contributors, and and trying to trying to go from there. Um, so it's interesting. Like I I've, I've had kind of a like an opposite experience but then at the same time i still find that the act of editing and and being an editor being a publisher and stuff has uh enriched my own writing process so it does give me things to think about that that um i may end up implementing later on um the the comment that you had clark on the on on zine culture is also you know really interesting because of the fact that um it's ties obviously to punk scene like hardcore scene and stuff indie rock certainly i feel like there was a point i remember being in high school where zines uh you know back way back in the 90s um where it was really really popular and stuff and then i feel like it kind of waned a little bit and then i went to school up in the bay area and then and saw it much more often and and it became kind of a currency and and a way of being able to you know not have to go through a kind of having a gatekeeper um and and certainly like you were able to you know i guess for lack of a better term it was it was a you know much more democratized like a uh, ecosystem than than say like a traditional like publishing uh system yeah, and so. yeah i mean the thing the thing that like came out of you know zine culture for me and i think for just like you know like it's the obvious lesson that I hope everyone learns in doing it is like, you know, um, working as a publisher, people will submit stuff to me. And, you know, uh, Jared's book is actually the first book that I put out that's been a submission by someone I didn't know personally mm -hmm. uh, or didn't seek out myself already. And people will submit stuff to me and I always try to give it the time of day. But like, you know, not all of it's like good 
Uh, so it, it doesn't happen. But what, what you learn from zine culture is like you're going to submit things everywhere and you're going to, you know, not, you know, like not a lot of it's going to get accepted. Um, but why don't you just fucking do it yourself? Like mm -hmm. the, the materials are there, you know, if you're an able bodied person and like it doesn't even have to really cost that much money. Like you can make, you know, uh, yeah copies of the library or whatever i mean back in the day I mean, it was really easy to scan kinkos and all that sort of stuff so that was great and, um yeah there i'm sure there are loopholes to it now you know yeah the the author um uh anna caretti she has just published an inordinate number of of zines and small chapbooks herself and and yeah. this is in between her publications and and i i i would Dane to assume that she she does this because of the fact that she has more control over the you know obviously over the creative process layout and and everything else and and those kind of aspects of control when it comes to publishing are are important for her and so I can you know that I can see that with with zine culture and and um, I think the thing that's been really wonderful from from my perspective has just been the uh, resurgence of interest in zines or maybe the continuing, uh, interest in, in zines with like LA zine fest and, and zine fest around the country and, and how that, um, it's been, you know, again, a form of currency and like communication with, with different people. And, and I, I really love that, uh, being able to like hand stuff off to people and, you know, that that's been handmade. And that was something that, you know, I had a, a group of friends that down in San Diego where we assembled a zine for, you know, a small chapbook, essentially, like, and we just basically sat out on my buddy's patio and, you know, and punched holes and printed stuff off and, you know, and then just sewed them up. And, and then we just had them and gave them, gave them to people and, and did like little, like a little reading and stuff. And it was, it was cool. Like in that, and that really was the thing that at the core of it was a uh, was community and like being able to use use it as a way to be able to connect with other writers in in a very tactile like you know tactile way yeah i mean it's it's funny like the you know i think the earliest zines that i read where i like i consciously realized what i was reading and it wasn't just like you know shit shit that people i knew had stapled together was like reading um reading aaron comic book scenes in high school and he, he he it was actually collected eventually in a book called Double Deuce. I think about this like punk house that he lived in in Berkeley. Mm -hmm. But they talk about like the house, and they talk about like uh, I think at one point like some of him and some of his friends uh, commandeer like a like a water tank to live in. And there's a bunch of other like crazy stories in there, just sort of the spaces that they carved out to make this stuff. And like as a person who just like wanted to get the fuck out of the town I was living in, and like you know go out and like do something mm -hmm. like that was really inspiring and I didn't quite have the words for it at the time, but I was realizing I was like learning about this culture that was all about creating your own space for yourself, you know? Um, so that's like kind of, or not for yourself, but for your community, you know? Um, so that's, that's what I've been like looking for with, with like the publishing work. Um, and it's funny you were saying that like zines kind of wax and waned like as uh, um, like in popularity. I actually like, I don't think they've ever been unpopular. I think mm -hmm. it's just like not like it's a nomadic community, you know, yeah. like yeah. Yeah. best will be really cool until a bunch of people who are really fucking uncool learn that scene fest is cool and they take it over. And like, you know, it's like a new yeah. thing that's to be made. I can't count how many fucking, and this, this is the same for the publishing world too. I can't count how many fucking art book fairs and shit like that were awesome in their early years. And then like, you know, eight years in, you're like, dude, I never want to set foot in this fucking space again. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So moving, moving on, I, Jared, maybe you want to start with this, but like, what are you, what are your favorite aspects of publishing? I mean, I, I know it's kind of a very, it's a very broad question, but like, what's something that, you know, what are things that you have, you know, enjoyed about the, like the, you know, the publishing experience and stuff, whether it's, you know, working, for example, with Clark or with the other presses and stuff that have that have put out your work, uh, or just you know putting together your own stuff. Um, I mean, I should probably start and say that I hate publishing. Uh, it's, not, <laughs> <laughs> it's not that I hate publishers; I just hate publishing. Like I, I hate. Um, how many times have I said I hate already? Intense. <laughs> uh, I, I can also kind of second that. It does suck. Um, I mean, 
you know, if you think just the word publishing, like literally just means to make public, I, I feel like it should be easier um, to make your work public. And like, that is the, that is one of the reasons why the zine, um, you know, has arisen out of a punk ethos. It's to say, we should be able to make this public. Like, why not? Why do you need to have uh, a second party or a sort of large moneyed entity to make or work public? Uh, why do you have to have these intercessors? Like self-publishing, for example, um, has always uh, and continues to have a kind of, I don't know, like classist stink around it. I don't know why, um, but the sense is if you self-publish, then you are lacking in authority. Uh, mm -hmm. You have not had the prestige of a publisher conferred upon you. Uh, literally, you lack authority, so you shouldn't be an author. I hate mm. about publishing. Um, I hate that the term, um, I think I've said I hate now 12 times. Um, <laughs> um, I hate that the terminology for sending out your work is to submit. You have your submissions, like that sucks. I hate putting together submissions. I hate writing cover letters. Um, I hate having a bio. Um, my author bio is always Jared Joseph is boring. Um, I think that people often think that this is me being self-deprecating. I do think I'm boring, um, but that's not what I'm you know, saying. I'm just saying that bios are boring. And so mm. um, it is just my way of being like, I will not participate in this, although I have to. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I hate all of that about publishing. Uh, what do I publishing i wonder um i like you know meeting clark for example who is now my friend um i find people again in small press publishing um because if you look at like the larger press stuff i mean that's all market incentive stuff you also need an agent who i think you can become friends with agents i think they agents have the technology to become your friends um but otherwise like agents also double as editors at this point uh, they double as sort of like uh, publicity people. And then the large press essentially at this point feels like a corporate entity um, that is trying to see if your book is fiscally viable and meets mm -hmm. trends. Uh, with small presses, it's nice. Um, I mean, it's ironic because I think that the closure of uh, small press distribution, SPD, a month or two ago after, you know, 55 years of having been uh, a distribution agent, and then basically becoming the most important one for small presses. After it folded, it taught us that small presses actually do want to make money, but they don't make money. Uh, nonetheless, small presses are pretty aware that they're not going to make money. They're for profit, but um, you know they're in a precarious position. Uh, they're not looking to come up with bestsellers. That's a laughable oxymoron in small press publishing. So mostly you're just meeting people who love books, you know, mm -hmm. love art, who love writing. And then you get to also meet other authors that are a part of that. And then there is a kind of like DIY necessary attitude that you have to cultivate in order to do, in order to tour, uh, in order to do reading events. Small presses can, you know, give you money to fund you on that, but most of them can't. Um, so you get, there is a literal labor of love feeling to it where I'm like, publishing with small presses is cool because it's like, I guess I'll just die alone, you know, uh, and, you know, never be like famous or anything like that. I guess uh -huh. I just like really like writing and reading, you know, it, yeah. like convinces me um, that maybe I have some kind of like morality or integrity or something. That's kind of, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. one thing I do like about publishing though. Um, and this is just a uh, sort of logistical, uh, but also somewhat aesthetic or philosophical, uh, is that once I have published a poem or a story or a book or whatever, it's done. Uh, if it's not published, I'm still thinking about everything wrong with it. You know, like, does it have a shitty nose? You know, um, does it have an earthmark? Um, should it wear a tie or a bow tie? But once it's published, I'm like, well, you're finished. Like, there's nothing I have to do yeah. anymore. Like, yeah. You know, so like, yeah, yeah. I don't have to do any. It's it's finished. I can think about new. Things. Yeah, I, I I think that's true that uh I, I once read somewhere that that it's 
kind of like once you when, once it's out in the world in in a published format it takes on a life of its own so you just kind of you're taking whatever creative work that you've had and you birthed it and now it is it is off on its own and you know you wish it you wish it the best of its own life and and hopefully it survives so yeah it's it's just kind of sending things off and 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 hoping it goes it goes well uh gosh there's so there's so much to, to, to touch on that you you hit upon um but clark i wanted to give you a, a, also give you a chance and stuff to maybe kind of talk about and thank you jared for for all of your comments because that my follow-up question was going to be what are your least favorite aspects of publishing but I, you kind of knocked that one out, so, so I appreciate that. But um, Clark, do you want to do you want to elaborate on on kind of like both your favorite and least favorite aspects of, of yeah. publishing? Yeah, sure. I mean, well, I was, I was you know, uh, Jared kind of went over a lot of similar uh, things that I uh, think and feel about publishing. I on the side that I hate, uh, I I fucking hate ISBNs at this point. Um, <laughs> And the funny thing is, like, I've never actually bought an ISBN for any of the books that I put out. They're all like no ISBN. There, there is a book that looks really cool called No, no ISBN that's all about self publishing. And I never, I never I need to like figure out who did that and check it out. But anyway, uh, fuck ISBNs. Um, I get it. Uh, I like uh, organization and cataloging and that sort of stuff. Um, what I don't like about them is they remind me of the bureaucracy within the industry. I was taking a stack of Jared's books to a shop fairly recently. Uh, I went in to uh, talk to the people in receiving um, and they looked through the book and they asked, oh, like, oh, where's the ISBN? And I was like, oh, there's no ISBN. No problem for them. But just like that moment of scrutiny, like mm -hmm. just triggered like everything that makes me think of like fucking Kafka or like whatever, you know? Um, it's a bummer that you need these sort of like seals that uh, validate like the things that you're putting out. Um, but, you know, Jared has written what I think is an excellent book uh, uh, that touches on like the essential plight that we're all uh, subject to, like having mm -hmm. to like, work our asses off for like shit we don't care about for the rest of our fucking lives, you know? Um, and it, uh, yeah, just, it's just, just having like the ISBN like momentarily scrutinized, like just triggered this little piece of anger within me, you know? And uh, on the other side, uh, something that I do like about publishing a lot, um, and this has to do with like a network of organization and stuff like that too. Um, although I guess you are paying money for this. I fucking love printers, man. Um, mm -hmm. A good printer who works, you know, works with uh, art books and uh, novels and what have you uh, is so indispensable and so fucking cool. Um, I will shout out Alco in Glendale, the people I print with uh, here in Los Angeles. Uh, it's this family-run spot. Uh, they're amazing. They're so cool to work with. And when you were talking about the um, community aspects of zines uh, and how you, you know, did the little reading where you, uh, you and your friends all sort of like punch holes and stapled things into stuff like uh, into your work, uh, I fucking hate that part. I hate. That. <laughs> I hate making 50 copies of something and assembling uh -huh. it like i'm furious every time <laughs> I have to do it. and i have like the like i have like an expensive paper cutter and like you know fucking deep throat stapler and like all the binding stuff that i need i i loathe doing it every time and anytime i have to get ready for a fair and i there's an item i have to like uh, hand assemble i'm just fucking pissed i will do it last minute if like, the most last minute possible uh which is weird because i also you know make a bunch of you know very tactile art on my own but but i i just i just need mass production it's just like bless any printer who like is out there doing that part of the work for me and if they do a good job and can do it for an affordable price uh bless them even more those are those are the true uh the true deities in the uh publishing world to me well and i was gonna say the uh because you and i had recently discussed the fact that you had, had reached out to that printer and you know for rose mask and and it was you know the books are beautiful i mean i can't you know recommend it enough for one for jared's writing which i adore but um also the design of the book i mean it's just it's an art object as well as a great piece of literature and so i i think that you know i encourage our listeners to to pick up copies of it thank you also, uh, really briefly, uh, the cover photographer, Rob Williamson, I want to give credit to him. He has a studio up in Oakland. He's a pal of mine, but he does excellent work. 
I think he has a website, robistall.com or something. So I hope I got that right. But anyway, he just deserves a mention before yeah. we go on. Well, and that and that brings it back to the, I guess, the sense of community to be able to to generate such, uh, you know, cool work and stuff in concert with you know other photographers, uh, graphic designers, uh, you know, um, painters. Sometimes I I, I like that collective um, effort. I guess my 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 next question that I kind of want to get into is just you know talking about like you know book design clerk you had mentioned that like you know you you don't want to like get together and like you know cut up paper and punch holes and like sew things together and stuff but is there an aspect of like the like the actual book design that you um that that you like like the design process that that you enjoy yeah absolutely i mean i I love doing layout and like just figuring out how everything's going to rest on a page i like figuring out you know what uh image or passage or whatever is going to follow another if i'm doing something that's like more art oriented not just like a straight you know novel or what have you and yeah and with like uh with rose mask with jared's work uh you know reading his book for the first time like i pretty much immediately thought of what i wanted to see in my head and i knew like the exact artist to do that um so that was exciting for me like i've i've been you know, I don't like I don't like the mass production element of it because that part just gets that's boring. Like that's the work to me. But the part that isn't work per se in my mind is just the creative element of like, you know, visualizing the object and making the like the one master copy real. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's like like I said, I, I mean, I make you know, I've been drawing since I could pick up a pen. I'm really I was really into photography for a really long time. I still am. Um, you know, I have made sculpture and all sorts of weird stuff so and and from sort of inhabiting like you know the zine culture world and the art world and all this sort of stuff like i'm lucky enough to know a lot of people that make really incredible work so um yeah that's like if i can't do something myself it's really exciting for me to think about like who goes with what and like how to curate things like that i hate the fucking word curate i I think it was like ruined by i don't know the internet or something i don't know what ruined period? <laughs> uh, um, but great, yeah, great yeah. question. So, what about the word Keurig, <laughs> Keurig. Uh, yeah, Keurig. A uh, Keurig was never ruined. Keurig is well. Keurig. Keurig was maybe ruined by like the alt right. Uh, <laughs> but I think I think Keurig is will always have like a novel place in my heart. Those things are insane <laughs> i i worked at the the marciano art museum the art center whatever the fuck they were calling it when uh the marciano family decided to fucking fire everyone uh for trying to unionize um i was planning on only staying there for like a little bit but uh, they were doing going through the unionization process i was like oh, i'll try working here for a while and like see how this goes but one of the things that stood out to me is they had two keurigs in the break room and that was all they offered the employees like <laughs> Yeah. Uh, anyway, sorry, that's a little tangent. But it's just forever in my mind that these like child labor exploiting assholes, like you know, can't pay their workers in America an extra buck, you know. And, right. But the, yeah, these fucking Keurigs, whatever. Yeah, I, I think that's a tendency on uh, big business owners, and it's like holding up a keys, like keys, and dangling them for a child or something, you know. Yeah, yeah, it's like, like, it's like, like a Keurig. Like it's like the pizza party instead of the raise. Yes. Like, uh, yeah. But anyway, I, I'm totally, I'm, I'm way off and <laughs> somewhere else. I've been drinking coffee this whole interview. I uh, right there with you, Jared. Are, are there aspects of, of the book design process that you like? Um, just in terms of thinking about layout from an author standpoint, I personally like, I, I really enjoy, you know, kind of going down the rabbit hole of like working on formatting for my work. And, you know, and I know it presents a challenge for my publisher when they actually have to go about putting it into, you know, a format that they can then print. But there is something about it for me that aspect of design is also really interesting. And and I wonder if, you know, that's something you have a similar experience or do you find it, you know, distracting and if it takes away from from the process for you? Uh, well, as a kind of segue into answering that question, uh, I just Googled the book No ISBN from Printed Matter Press. Uh, and uh, for those listening to this podcast who'd be interested in searching it by its ISBN number, its ISBN number is 978 
you what three. What the fuck? I've been lying first, to you. Yeah. Two, eight. Um, apparently, this is a second edition. Maybe the first edition didn't have an ISBN, but it's, now it's, yeah. got, it's got one. Um, but, you know, I haven't read this. Uh, it's called No ISBN and then subtitle colon uh, on self-publishing. Uh, but it says here that it's glue bound and it's sewn bound. Uh, so that makes sense that, you know, like its content is enacted in the form. And that is something that I do love. Like I think about book design a lot. I love books. Like I just love the book as a form, um, just like as a fact, just as a physical fact, like I love books and I love book arts and I always have. And so like I have often like, just made books um just for fun like i was trying to make like a holy book or something uh so i wrote it on this like beautiful you know weird antique kitschy uh grocery list paper uh and then i bound it in sandpaper because i was like well the holy should hurt you know and i've like made scrolls with vellum out of the dowel of typewriters just for fun you know and like that's just something that i kind of like to do uh, and then I am generally thinking about, especially with, you know, for example, this book, No ISBN, and perhaps there was a time when it didn't have an ISBN, and that was like part of the intention. Uh, and then it, you know, presents itself as a self-published object, uh, although ironically, it's not. I really like playing with like the medium and the form. It's really important to me. Just the the words themselves and the text them itself doesn't really make sense without the literal context, which is the book, and which is the pages. So um, another thing that I do like about small presses is that you generally do have more leeway um, in being like, I kind of want to do this for fun, you know? So for example, like Clark, let me get you know, instead of blurbs from, you know, quote unquote, real authors, um, I was able to get blurbs uh, for Rose Mask, which is the book about uh, my experience uh, in the service industry, specifically during the um, mass service era pandemic. Um, I got blurbs from my coworkers, you know, just um, so mm -hmm. that felt good. And then uh, working with uh, Kern Punk Press, for example, the editor being Jesse Bender, who's like amazing. And she's like, awesome. And they put out great books. Uh, she let me choose the cover for it, you know, and she like gave me a lot of freedom in that. Um, and then I was like, I am designing this like a, like it's a Cliff's Notes book. So I have all of this like weird paratext. I put like a quiz at the very end um, so that it seems like a Cliff's Notes uh, educational tool. And then I put, you know, a character list at the beginning. And then I was like, I want this book to be like really small. So it's like a pop book. And she was like, mm -hmm. yeah, I don't fucking care. And I was like, great. Um, so yeah, like book design is beautiful. Like I just think of them as objects. And if I can make it so that, uh, let's say just, you know, the medium or the form can present or interact with ironically or uh, syncopatedly, the con with the content, uh, then I'm really pleased. And then I think of it as a successful book. It's not just an incidental aspect of what's inside the book. It's the whole thing. So I, I love design. It's very important to me when a book um, is that well thought out. If I get a book called No ISBN, um, it is a missed opportunity if it has an ISBN. So that the irony of that being a printed mass because that's just it's kind of like a hazy memory for me like but it's something that i saw i'm sure at a printed matter art book fair and was like oh i should check that out someday and i just like never encountered it again and just never got around to looking it up online the irony of it being a printed matter book with an isbn is if you're in the art book world at all is very funny um <laughs> it's hard to explain why that's funny if you're not yeah, you haven't been immersed in that before. Yeah, I uh, uh, I'd be curious to um, get the thoughts. Of my, Matthew Timmons from uh, Insert Press is um, very much uh, in in the art book world, and in addition to the literary world, and and uh, so I I would be very curious about his thoughts on the matter as well, because I know that he's uh, I believe he's well acquainted with the with the folks from Printed Matter, and so. Um, yeah, that's that's really funny. Um, yeah, printed matter is just it's one of those things that's like it's a it's a big enough and known enough institution that it like it can't be perfect, you know? 
Mm-hmm. Uh, and this is just like one little insignia of that, of just being like, oh, come on, you guys. <laughs> you <know? laughs> yeah. Um, they do a lot of great work, but there's, there's some, there's so many moments with them where you're just like, for real. <laughs> <laughs> um. In light of the recent, you know, we just kind of referring back to the beginning of our discussion in light of the recent implosion of SPD and then kind of the continuing consolidation of the the publishing industry. And, you know, Jared, you touched on this uh, somewhat with kind of respect to the stigma that's attached to like, quote unquote, like vanity publishing. Just thinking about like the publishing landscape in general, do you still feel like the kind of the direction that I guess, and it, and I know that this is a fraught term and, and probably kind of a loaded term, but the industry itself, it's still thriving. And do you feel optimistic about, you know, the way things are going? Or is it kind of a sense that things are, you know, on, on unsteady ground? Because I, I go, for myself, I tend to go back and forth. Like sometimes I feel really, you know, I'm feeling good about things. And I feel like there's a actually a thriving industry that is continuing to produce really interesting work. But then other days I read about, you know, presses having to go under, especially with uh, SPD collapsing and, and it, you know, and it's terribly sad to think about like all of these amazing presses uh, having to succumb to financial pressures and, and basically watching their books, like, you know, turn into mulch. So I guess I just, you know, question for both of you, kind of like what your, you know, what your, your outlook is and like, how do you, how are you feeling about, you know, kind of the direction that things are going? Um, I can weigh in um, by Jared because there's no faces of podcast. Um, I um, I mean, I don't really think of myself as like an optimist, you know, like I'll, I'll talk to people and if someone needs optimism, I'll give them it, you know, like I can do that. <laughs> I can find it. I can manufacture it. If someone wants uh, pessimism, uh, I can give that as well. Um, but a lot of it, I think it's interesting that a lot of people have been uh, describing this as like a tragedy. Um, so I think that that means that there's a lot of pessimism um, around it. Um, also a tragedy. Uh, I mean, you know, like Greek tragedy is weird because, uh, you know, like a lot of characters act surprised um, by tragedy. Usually it's tragic if if you didn't know it was coming. Um, but then it's also fated to be, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and I think with SPD, it is kind of similar because, I mean, they, uh, you know, they had their sort of, um, there was the reveal about their like horrific labor practices in like 2021. A lot of presses, not actually, actually not a lot, but a few presses um, just opted out of SPD altogether as a result. But and so like and then they have been, you know, they've been around for 50 years and it is, you know, um, amazing that they were there. But like they kind of did have a monopoly in this way on distribution. Uh, There are other distribution, uh, you know, industries for small press. Um, Probably the best one is Asterism. And that is kind of coming to step into the hole that... uh, SPD mm-hmm. just like blasted open and that's good but SPD kind of it offered a whole lot you know like it, it if you were with SPD if your book was distributed through SPD it was regularly updated on their website um they were regularly promoting you they got you into bookstores they wrote copy for you to get into bookstores like they kind of forced you into it because they i mean they did all this work that none of the other ones did but they also charged you small fees quote unquote small fees for literally everything you know like even though they were the best of the small presses they were basically spirit airlines um they just, like mm-hmm. fucked you on every single thing um and then Uh, Also notorious for not paying people back fully or in a timely manner uh, for the books that they sold. And then when SPD did fold, you know, there are presses that are owed, you know, tens of thousands of dollars. And this is not new. These presses that worked with SPD, like they had been waiting for that money for a while, hoping they would. Mm -hmm. Uh, And then all the books that SPD still had, they sent to Ingram warehouses, those fucks. And then Ingram is charging them to ship their books back. And it's also put a deadline for a month. Otherwise, they'll be liquidated. So there are all these small presses that are absent their own books, like their own actual copies of it that they have to pay for under 
duress of time. Um, and they also haven't been paid for the books that have been sold. And so with what money are they going to buy back their own books? Uh, so then you see all these presses doing kind of like GoFundMes. And that's been kind of heartening because, I mean, you know, they're meeting their goals, a lot of them. But it also just highlights how precarious uh, small press publishing has been for how long when being $8,000 in debt will collapse you. You know, that's yeah, a company. Yeah. That's a company that can be collapsed by $8,000. I can be collapsed by $8,000. Um, but I am not a company. Um, but I guess companies are people. Companies are people too, but people are not also companies, right? Yeah. Like there's the whatever. So no, I, I don't feel any optimism about small presses. Um, and when I see GoFundMes crop up, I'm like, good, you know, but when you ask a community that makes no money, um, like the people that are going to contribute to GoFundMes, those are going to be other people in publishing and other writers in small press. Mm -hmm. We already have no money. Uh, so now we have to hemorrhage our own money to give our own money to our own people. Um, right. So that yeah. sucks. Um, the one ray of light in all of this for me is that it has always been bad. I never expected it to be good. And my ray of light is like really particular to me. I know it means something very particular. Um, <laughs> my ray of light, the color of, um, never mind. Um, but like, uh, <laughs> I was going to say, the color of dog shit, but I guess I just, that. Um, but yeah, if you uh, want to edit that out, like um, you're a publisher. Um, but in any case, um, yeah, I, I have never seen small presses um, to be anything uh, remotely profitable. It seems that most of them have not seen themselves to be profitable as well. Um, I do think that this is rather cataclysmic, um, but, you know, it has been a sort of like low grade cataclysmic affair all along from inception. And as an ethos, I think that that's like really brave and courageous. Um, so I think things will be, I don't know if things will be okay, but like things have never been okay. And it's actually, I mean, when things are not okay, um, and you have publishers publishing the work of writers who are writing because things are not okay, that's amazing. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. No, I have no optimism, but I, in the end, I don't think anything really new has happened. Um, and I think that like, we've been pretty flexible and innovative all along. Um, I just hope that there is some kind of like fiscal system, some kind of like, I don't know, some kind of burden sharing system uh, that can be done here. Um, I work in the service industry, I'm thinking like tip pooling, you know, like I don't even know, mm -hmm. um, but something mm -hmm. has to change because this thing that happened was inevitable, right? And this was, not something radically, I guess, like revolutionary that happened with SPD collapsing. This was radically devolutionary. Like this is a sign mm -hmm. of decay. So like we need to innovate yeah. fiscally in some way. But I don't, yeah. you know, I fucking creative writing major. I have no idea. <laughs> the question I always ask myself about the, or I've been asking myself about the whole like SPD debacle has been like, how is everyone going to learn like the same lesson together from this. Cause I agree with like a ton of what you just said. I don't feel necessarily pessimistic about it really, because like you were saying, it's always been precarious and, you know, uh, sort of doomed situation, you know? Um, but like, I, I do feel bad for a lot of the publishers who are truly being tanked by this, but like, a, a huge, huge part of me is it's like, you didn't fucking know, like we could, we could never trust this infrastructure, you know? Um, and it comes back to the thing about sort of like creating your own space and finding your own people and working together with, with that. And it, what I, what I keep wondering is like, how do we make everyone just sort of collectively like realize it this time? And then like, how do we start the conversation about like, you know, building that infrastructure in a way that sort of like benefits us? Because like no one's going to fucking stop publishing, you know, like yeah. SPD will yeah. not exist. Uh, you know, whatever replaces it uh, in this, this similar capacity will like work for a while and fall apart or whatever. But people are going to be publishing until they're fucking like. It, until it's you know their manifesto and shit and blood on the bunker wall like you know it's it's like 
like people are going to have this need to get their work and their ideas out there. I think what I see uh, in this is also like just sort of like a like a greater problem with like the resistance to like you know just the capitalist society that we live in not to get like you know fucking joker about it or something but you know what I mean? like it, it's like people are looking for solutions to all of these problems that are happening and uh and watching what's going on with publishing and how the media is falling apart how distribution has been been taken over is all part of the same major problem you know so mm -hmm. um yeah i don't know i'm, I'm hoping that uh there's some way that we we can figure this out as like a community of like presses and artists and uh, distributors and so forth uh, to realize like, Hey man, we, we got to like sit down and like figure out something better, you know? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's interesting. Cause I, I think the, the question on using collectivism as a way to be able to bolster the health of presses and then also like to be able to to provide a, a new infrastructure where there is a unified sense of of purpose and mission to to support one another and to be able to fill in certain gaps in in different instances um would be would be interesting whether or not that's you know we're capable of being able to do that in a very you know kind of patchwork landscape where that is almost like anathema to the you know to the uh american myth of you know self-determination and like you know and and you know it's i think that another aspect of it that's interesting is that when you look at other countries there's quite a bit of state funding for you know especially and I'm, I'm thinking specifically of like western europe where there's a lot of programs that are out there and stuff specifically to to bolster you know the the uh, publishing industry and also just for artists in general yeah. and, and we don't we don't have that here and so thinking about it it's like we because there is a, a lack of that support you know it'll be interesting to see kind of what uh what ideas germinate and like what will actually come to fruition you know in, in light of this this shifting landscape and especially with the consolidation of these you know much larger entities like random house and penguin and like all the kind of like the really big publishing companies and stuff that are continuing to consolidate and you know and and effectively creating these monopolies over you know what's actually getting out to market and stuff and absorbing small presses in the process and and i think that that's something that is you know is concerning to me but despite how tenuous things might seem i still also you know hold out some like I don't know if it's if it's hope but just you know um i i believe that there's enough uh uh resilience um in and amongst a lot of publishers and writers to you know just continue doing what they're doing and stuff and like you said clark it's like people want to put you know they're going to write and they're going to write and and get their work out there in some some capacity and and Absolutely. you know it's going to keep happening yeah, I, I think about something that a, a friend of mine in high school said. I think we were in like our senior year and, you know, like that era of like getting ready to move on. Uh, and I, I can't remember how the conversation led up to this, but I was talking about my desire to like, you know, get out uh, of our town and start working on this book that I had in mind and blah, blah, blah. And he said something like, something along the lines of like, you know, Clark, life isn't all about writing a book. And I was like, well, fucking show you, you know? <laughs> Um, and and you know he he's right it's it's not like really you know about writing a book but uh like one specific book but like that's become the thing that i like care the most about at this point mm -hmm. and i like reject like any sort of nihilism around the idea that like you know publishing is falling apart uh that that uh distribution like uh can't be solved uh that things can't get out there it's like no fuck no like this is part of the human experience to want to like collect uh the things that you are uh lucky enough to live through and reproduce them and share them with other people you know mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so i i mean i don't i don't feel like pessimistic about uh spd closing or amazon's monopolies or anything like that i i, I think there's always going to be like some energy to to blast against that yeah um so just to you know just to finish up um can both of you 
share projects that you're currently working on and, and also just letting our audience know where to locate your, your work online or uh, just out in the world? Yeah, I, uh, what am I working on right now? I'm finishing up a novel called uh, The School of How Can I Live uh, about someone who works, teaches at a school called The School of How Can I Live. I think it's fine. You know, I think it's okay. I'm not ashamed of it. Um, so that's cool. <laughs> um, and I've also been like teaching at a gallery space in, in LA in uh, Fairfax, uh, creative writing workshop. Um, called the school of how can I live um, just to see just like what it's like to make the book sort of uh, spill out of its own bounds uh, and that's been kind of fun to do uh, and then it's been it's funny how the class will then affect the material in the book um, mm. how the book uh, will affect what I teach in the class and the teacher uh, in the book has no answer to the question of how can I live you know um, which to me actually kind of seems, I don't know, like a sign of integrity to not have answers to any of those questions and not expect to give them uh, and in fact refuse to give them. Um, and I think that's made me a better teacher just kind of writing about it. So that's been kind of cool. Uh, and then right now I'm working on a project that's like, it's like 50,000 words right now. I think it's like the worst thing I've ever written. Um, <laughs> but um, it was again teaching uh at the school i'm doing like big uh air quotes like over and over again right now on the zoom screen but um teaching at the school of how can i live i asked uh students to do a writing exercise where uh, it, it was less creative and more um, just kind of thoughtful and reflective uh which i wanted uh students to think about something that makes them feel anxious to write, like a specific formal problem uh, that students have that makes them feel anxious to write or paralyzed beforehand. They're like, oh, I'm going to have to do this, though. And then to try to turn that in an, into an opportunity uh, for a different kind of writing project that in, somehow, in some way engages that problem or that anxiety as a challenge. Um, and you know, that sentence uh, that I just stated is not very clear, or very straightforward. And I realized that as I was teaching. And then I was like, wait, do you guys want an example? And one of them was like, yeah. <laughs> I was like, okay. So I was like, well, I for one hate write, writing setting. Like I hate describing things. Like I just hate it. Um, I don't want to describe a sunbeam. I don't want to describe a blade of grass. I don't want it to be metaphorical. I don't fucking care. Is there a barn in this chapter? Like, I'm just going to say there's a barn, you know, I'm not going to mm -hmm. say, I'm not going to say like what the wood is like. I don't fucking care. And so, and I was like, so what I would maybe do with that is I would just try to see if I could write a story uh, that has no setting whatsoever. Uh, instead of trying to solve the problem, be like, well, what would that be like if there was a story without setting? And then I said that and I was like, wow, all this is true. And then, so I've been trying to do that as like write a, a novel without setting um, mm -hmm. and because I'm bad at logic um, I decided that uh, when you have when you have characters when you have a person when you have a main character then then you have you know secondary characters the secondary characters are part of the setting that's a problem mm -hmm. so you can't have mm -hmm. any secondary characters um, and you can't have any pronouns that are not the first person either um, so I've been writing a novel that is full of main characters. All of them speak in the first person. And uh, there are no other pronouns. There's no he, she, you, they. And this is the worst thing I've ever read. That I've written. Like, this is so frustrating. Um, and is there's no pleasure in the writing of it whatsoever. Um, but I can't That's stop. Insane. <laughs> what so it's fucking insane. And, uh, <laughs> it's the dumbest thing I've ever done, you know. But um, I want to read it. But yeah, yeah. <laughs> you're maybe the only one. I don't. Know. Like I haven't even read it. I've just been writing it. But what? It's uh, holy shit! It's 129 pages. I don't even know that. Wow. Well, that's wow. unfortunate waste. Of time. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's what I've been. Uh, those are the projects I've been working on. Um, 
and then yeah i'm excited that uh clark put out rose mask um as a sort of like uh inaugural uh literary venture for your press five nine that's already put out like beautiful and hilarious artworks art books uh so that's cool i i think uh if i can uh i did want to touch on like one more thing about publishing shit uh um, sure which is just that I think it is interesting to talk about like small presses uh, and then large presses. I, I think it's wrong to talk about them as if they are so separate from one another. I mean, in a lot of ways, and especially in fiscal ways, we know that they are so separate from one another um, when you have something called small press distribution mm -hmm. and then the small presses that were with it are completely fucked. But on the other hand, and you know, like Adam, you were talking about this, but in an age of consolidation and specifically conglomeration that's been happening like at the very least since the 70s and the 80s presses are owned by other companies that are owned by other companies that are owned by other companies you know like there's so many and there are still big presses that then have an independent looking imprint you know um but some of them still put out interesting work i guess like what i'm trying to say is whether it's small press and whether it's uh, like one of the big presses, most of it's bad, you know, like most writing is bad. Uh, and all of them are putting out like bad shit, you know. Um, but sometimes you find weird big press stuff that is really good. And then also, like you were saying about the sort of like government, like state sponsored structure of the arts in America versus in other countries, especially uh, Western Europe, you know, like we're talking about, you know, the publishing industry in America, but, you know, like Europa editions, for example, everything they do is fucking fire and that's crazy. And so I, I don't know. I, the thing that really just worries me is it's not the like long term you know, sort of apocalyptic, people are going to write less daring work. Because most people aren't daring. Most people are not writing daring work, you know? My only real concern is just that a lot of presses might close down right now at this moment. And that sucks. Like, that to me yeah. is the tragedy. Like, most might just be, all, like, insolvent within, like, a month. And I want, to, I want to second that because I, I feel like I glazed over that when I mentioned it, but that does really fucking blow. Like, I hate that. I, I agree. And, and you know, there's there's only so much um, largesse that other presses that might might be thriving in this this landscape like they that that might be able to take on and add like provide a lifeline for for some of those books. But but it, it is uh very tenuous and and it's not only the presses it's the you know specifically the authors who've put a lot of inf like a lot of effort and and work into those books as well and and you know to see their publications maybe fall into obscurity um because of you know just not having the platform for it and and that goes back to the thinking about you know ways to be able to help facilitate um the continuation the, the you know to to allow the lifespan of those books and um some of those those uh imprints to like continue and you know in a way that is conducive to their ongoing success and stuff but also providing like a platform for other presses you know and other other um organizations to use almost as maybe like as a template or something yeah and and these 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 presses that did work with spd and, and um you know, have like have to work with Ingram or whatever. Like, they're not stupid for like doing that in the first place. Like, when I was uh, sort of like, of course, yeah, of course, it fell apart. That's not to imply that they made like a bad choice in like working mm -hmm. uh, in working with this like infrastructure that was already set up for them. Because like, what else do you fucking do? You know, um, when when like that's presented to you uh, like out the gate. But um, I hope that, that it's like eye opening enough for enough people to that some sort of greater conversation to start about how to how to make that not happen anymore. Um, yeah, I'm just really quick. I'm gonna plug my my uh, sites and stuff. Um, I uh, I have like a million projects uh, that I'm working on, and none of them I'm 
going to specifically highlight except five nine press i'm working on a uh, literary journal uh that i don't want to call a literary journal i'll figure out uh what to call it as uh the project sort of materializes that's probably the next big thing and then a lot of other stuff that will be uh announced as i talk to artists and people that i'm working with to figure it out i also have my own substack called rent control that's rent but then control spelled with a K and then like a troll under a bridge with two L's. Uh, I'm one of the things I am uh, doing on there is I'm serializing uh, a bunch of writing that I've worked on over the years uh, into a series of zines called Google. Uh, eventually there will be the collected Google. Um, so people can subscribe to that, but yeah, uh, rent control dot substack and then five, nine press dot store NB. And that is the place where people can buy Jared's book, which I hope people do because I deeply enjoyed working with him. And I think it's a fucking awesome book. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, guys, thank you so much. Uh, this has been great. And um, yeah, like I said to all of our listeners, please go check out all of the various projects that Jared and Clark have out in the world. And um, we will look forward to, uh, to speaking with you guys again in the future. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Thank you to Jared Harvey and Clark Allen for joining us on this episode. Please be sure to like and subscribe. And if you're enjoying the podcast, leave us a review. You can find our most recent and all past issues at brokenlensjournal.com. And as a reminder, we accept submissions year round. So head to the website to submit your work there. Thanks to our producer, Destiny. And our theme music is composed and recorded by Art Santora. I'm Adam. And I'm Heather. Thanks for listening. Bye.